Okay, Stephen, I think we've got everyone who's going to join us uh, here. If you'd like okay. to kick it off. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, can't, I can't actually see because I'm, I'm reading from, from a different part of my screen. I can't see who's, who's joined in, but thank you, uh, whoever is there and who's, who's joined us this afternoon. Uh, and to those others in Goldsmith who have organized this and a number of other webinars. Um, Daniel is going to be speaking about personal insolvency, also known as bankruptcy. Um, he'll do that in a moment. And then I shall follow on with corporate insolvency. Uh, first, I suppose a few introductory words. What is insolvency? Well, in all cases, we're looking at money being owed. And if it is owed, can it be paid? And if it cannot be paid, what to do about it? More specifically, insolvency is either being unable to pay debts as they fall due, or where liabilities outstrip assets, or both. Insolvency is not necessarily the same thing as debt collection, albeit debt collection tends for obvious reasons to be a prelude to insolvency proceedings. Um, your go-to act, um, your go-to act of parliament is the Insolvency Act 1986. Uh, and although these civil procedure rules apply, um, there are also separate insolvency rules and court forms which can freely be downloaded. The most recent incarnation of the rules is from 2016. The Insolvency Act runs to 444 sections, which I think was probably not bad for the 1980s. Back then, it must have been one of the longest acts on the statute book, so it's not a trivial bit of kit. And the advantage of having pretty much um, all of the most relevant legislation in one place is somewhat counterbalanced by the size of the act itself. Likewise, the rules are 448 pages long. Uh, there is also a practice direction easily Googleable and mercifully somewhat shorter. In short, this is a big subject um, and our intention today is gently to, to lower into the pit of insolvency law um, those of you who are unfamiliar with it. But it's an area worth knowing um, uh, a little bit about, having it as part of your toolkit uh, and perhaps never more so um, than in the months ahead. Before I hand over to Daniel, I can tell you that he will be using slides and I will not, uh, mainly because using slides on Zoom is probably a technological step too far for me, but I can make some crib notes available to anyone who wants to email me. Uh, and I shall also point out at the bottom of your screen, um, you should have a, a button which is marked more with three dots above it, if you click on that, there's a chat function uh, stroke Q&A feature by which you can post questions as we go along. Uh, so Daniel, um, uh, bankruptcy, over to you. Thanks, Stephen. So as Stephen said, I'll be setting out a beginner's guide to bankruptcy, the process it follows, the requirements to be met, and how a debtor might avoid an order being made. Uh, I'll necessarily be focusing on um, petitions filed by creditors, as that's in reality uh, where the bulk of contentious work lies. Now, just a quick note on the effects of COVID-19. Uh, a temporary insolvency practice direction has been introduced. Uh, the link to that uh, is as appearing on the slide. Uh, the practice direction has been introduced primarily to avoid uh, the need for parties to attend court. It provides guidance as to what type of lists the court will provide and also provides changes to the manner in which documents are filed. So let's take a look at the process of bankruptcy. Uh, the process and time span is extremely straightforward. The proceedings begin when the petition is presented. The, the individual is a judge bankrupt on the date on which the order is made and discharged automatically on the first anniversary of the order. Now, before presenting a petition, a creditor must ensure that the requirements of bankruptcy are met. Now, I've put a number of those requirements up on the screen now. I don't intend to go through them in any detail. Uh, they're very straightforward. And as Stephen says, the slides will be uploaded uh, after the speech to the Goldsmith Chambers website. I just wanted to pick up on two of those requirements. Uh, the first is the creditor must satisfy the court uh, that an amount over £5,000 is owing, known as the bankruptcy limit. And secondly, the creditor must evidence that the debtor, debtor is not going to be able to pay the debt. Now, as Stephen will uh, 
uh, set out later, a creditor can do this uh, by relying on a statutory demand. And in fact, uh, Section 268 of the Insolvency Act requires a strat statutory demand unless the debt is a judgment debt. So as many of you will know, uh, if three weeks have passed after service of the statutory demand, and it hasn't been complied with or disputed within that time, uh, the debtor will be considered unable to pay the debt. Now, whilst in an ordinary case, uh, the debtor, or the, rather the creditor, will have to wait until the 21 days have expired, if there is a serious possibility that the debtor's property or the value of the property will be significantly diminished, uh, the creditor can uh, present the petition. If the creditor does seek to take such an approach, then they have to make uh, a statement attesting to that requirement uh, and include that within the petition. However, even if the creditor applies before the 21 days are up, the court will not make a bankruptcy order until uh, the three weeks have elapsed. Now, of course, caution has to be exercised when serving statutory demands. They should only be used for undisputed debts. And where the creditor knows that the debtor has a genuine dispute, uh, but is merely using the demand uh, as a means to apply pressure, this can constitute an abusive process and there may be uh, cost consequences as a result. So you have your papers together, you're confident that the requirements will be met, how do you start the process? So I've set out on the slide uh, the documents which will need to be filed along with the petition. Uh, again, uh, the, the documents are set out on the slide, they'll be uploaded afterwards but it is vitally important that they are presented along with the petition. Uh, if they're not, it's unlikely that the petition will get off the ground. Now, one important point to note is that some London areas uh, have been graced with their own rules as to which court uh, the petition should be presented to. Uh, so you have to check the requirements of Article 3 of the LIP order prior to presenting the petition. So, so far I've been assessing the creditor's stance. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, debtor's stance and how they might avoid a bankruptcy order. So firstly, and perhaps even before the petition is presented, the debtor can challenge or uh, apply to set aside the statutory demand. Any application to do so should be made normally uh, within 18 days from the date of service. However, that time can be extended by the court. Any petition which is presented while there is an outstanding application to set aside, uh, and a, a bankruptcy order should not be made in those circumstances. Secondly, a debtor may seek to establish that the underlying debt is genuinely disputed. And if a debtor takes this approach, they should file and serve their opposition no less than five business days before the hearing. So uh, although the bankruptcy procedure doesn't uh, cater for cross-examination, a judge at the first hearing should test both the arguments of the debtor and the creditor uh, so far as they're able to, uh, to see if the, the uh, debt is genuinely disputed. If the debt is genuinely disputed, the court should dismiss the application. Uh, thirdly, the court has discretion to adjourn the hearing uh, if the debtor uh, essentially wants more time in, in which to satisfy the demand. Now, this is frequently done by the courts on the first occasion, but subsequent occasions are more difficult to, to obtain. Now, the last two methods which are appearing on the slide now, uh, the first in relation to appeals, an order should not be made whilst there is an outstanding appeal of an underlying judgment debt. And secondly, uh, Office of Security, the debtor can request that the court dismiss the petition where the creditor has unreasonably refused an offer of security. 
So what happens if those attempts fail and a bankruptcy order has been made? Well, immediately after the order is made, the bankrupt's estate is managed by the official receiver. And then subsequently, if the estate funds permit, uh, an insolvency practitioner will take over the reins. Now, either the OR or the IP have the, have the power to challenge previous transactions of the bankrupt. Now, firstly, uh, any disposition of, the pro of property made by the bankrupt, uh, beginning with the period of the presentation of the, of the petition until the estate is vested in the trustee is automatically void. And subsequently, any property acquired after the, bankrupt, after the bankruptcy order is made, uh, if, if this property is acquired, the fact of this must be reported to the OR or the IP within 21 days of its acquisition. Now, it may be that uh, some debtors, anticipating their imminent insolvency, attempt to dissipate their assets, and they can do this months, if not years, before the bankruptcy order is made. Now, in this type of scenario, there are a variety of measures which a trustee can utilize. And effectively, the trustee will apply to vitiate and set aside the offending transactions. Uh, as I say, there are numerous uh, options available to a trustee, and those appear on the slide now. Uh, after any application is made, the matter will then proceed to a substantive fact-finding hearing where the court will hear live evidence. Uh, the court will effectively determine whether the debtor uh, attempted to put its possessions outside of the reach of the creditors. Now, the final slide there uh, explains the position as to discharge and annulment. Uh, the debtor is discharged from a bankruptcy automatically after one year from the bankruptcy order. And secondly, uh, the debtor can apply to annul the order if there were no grounds for uh, ordering the bankruptcy or if the debts and expenses of the bankruptcy have been paid or secured to the court's satisfaction. Okay, that concludes uh, a brief introduction to the bankruptcy procedure. I'll now hand over to Stephen, who will discuss corporate insolvency. Thank you. I'm going to take this as a bit of a canter because there's, there's a fair amount to get through. Um, like bankruptcy, uh, corporate insolvency is a class remedy. That, that's a very important point to get across. So the person who is the driving force behind, for example, a winding up petition, has no priority over any other person in the same class of creditors. The only distinction is between secured and unsecured creditors. Um, this is not like a classic civil claim. The court will concern itself not purely with the interests of a petitioner, but with the interests of all creditors. So the court ought to be understood as having a supervisory role over the proper conduct of businesses. Um, the only other cases I can think of where the court adopts this supervisory role concern trusts and disputed wills. So it's important to appreciate that in matters of corporate insolvency, the court is not merely an arena and the judge is not only an umpire. And the reasons for this lie in the public interest in ensuring corporate liability is not abused, and so public faith in the value of limited liability companies remains high. Um, so to recap, corporate insolvency comes within the ambit of the Insolvency Act 1986 and the Insolvency Rules 2016, and it is a class remedy. So far, that doesn't make it wildly dissimilar from individual bankruptcy. Where it differs markedly is in the menu of options open to creditors um, and indeed to those running companies. The reason for this bigger menu of options is that with individual bankruptcy, those most directly affected are the bankrupt, his family, especially if there's a family home, and what in most cases is his limited number of creditors, a mortgagee perhaps, some credit card companies and telecom service providers. But with companies, on the other hand, the expanding web of, ob of obligations fanning out from the potentially insolvent company can be far, far larger. It is likely to have more creditors, among them, in effect, its employees. The greater the number of employees, the greater the number, the greater the number of creditors, the greater the impact of corporate insolvency. If you, if you imagine throwing a stone into, into water and watching the ripples move outwards. 
So the court has on the one hand this supervisory role. It does not want the principle of limited liability to be abused. On the other hand, the most severe sanction, liquidation, the corporate equivalent of a bankruptcy order, can have devastating and very widespread effects. So the legislative re regime has developed to try and accommodate this balancing act, which is why we end up with this wide menu of options, incorporating company voluntary arrangements or CVAs, administration, receivership, and then finally winding up liquidation and dissolution, which are all part and parcel of the same process. Broadly speaking, these options can be divided into what can be called terminal and non-terminal insolvency. That is to say, it's the difference between an attempt to save a struggling company and the realization that nothing can be done to save it. Um, then you, you just end up picking over, the, picking over the carcass for whatever can be saved. Detailed discussion of all of these options is not something we have time for today, so I'm going to focus on one aspect each of terminal and non-terminal insolvency. So first, non-terminal insolvency, um, let's have a look at um, company voluntary arrangements. Uh, a firm can enter into a CVA with its creditors when it finds itself in financial difficulty, especially if that difficulty is, on the face of it, merely temporary and the basic business remains sound. In effect, the creditors agree to accept sums less than they are actually owed, or they agree to accept deferred payments. This may sound like an odd thing for them to do, but commercial reality often means that accepting that lesser amount means the firm, which is, after all, a trading partner, remains in business. And it may even be the case that the CVA offers creditors a better deal than they would end up getting uh, if the firm was wound up. Such an arrangement can be made informally. You don't have to go down, to, down the CVA route, but that doing it informally does have its risks because it does not bind all creditors. And therefore, if one of those creditors breaks ranks to pursue a winding up, then the agreement of all of the others will have been in vain. So a CVA is a statutory process intended to sidestep this problem. The CVA will typically be suggested by the firm's directors and is in effect a proposal made along similar lines to a pitch to investors, explaining why it is deemed necessary, giving details of the firm's finances and explaining how it is proposed to treat creditors. If the proposal is agreed, it'll be managed by a supervisor who is a qualified insolvency practitioner. He eventually takes on the role of ensuring that money is distributed as it ought to be. But before that, in the meantime, he prepares a report to the court as to the suitability and viability of the proposal, and then calls a meeting of creditors at which a majority of three quarters is required uh, in order to bind all creditors. Terminal insolvency. Well, um, let's just deal with a note on terminology. You'll, you'll hear, and I've already mentioned, words and phrases such as winding up, liquidation, and dissolution being used. They are all part and parcel of the same thing. Um, a winding up petition is granted, leaving a company in liquidation until it is finally dissolved. Equally, a company can simply be dissolved, for instance, if its members have no further use for it. Um, but today, of course, we're concerned with the insolvency position, not a situation where, for instance, the shareholders in a dormant company decide they're fed up with filing annual returns to company's house. There is, so far as creditors are concerned, no requirement to issue a statutory demand and to go through the process of having it challenged and potentially set aside. Um, that is not to say that a statutory demand cannot be used, nor that it might not serve a useful purpose, um, merely that the assertion of indebtedness and inability to pay is theoretically sufficient as a basis on which to issue a winding up petition as a prelude to liquidating a company. The de minimis level of indebtedness is also markedly different from that of bankruptcy at a mere 750 pounds. That's right, a petition to wind up a company can be issued if it owes 750 pounds or more and apparently cannot pay it. But this is not a decision likely or cheaply to be taken. The court issue fee is 280 pounds. And in addition, there is a deposit of 1600 pounds to manage the winding up if the petition is granted. The process is a formalized one, it, ha it has its own form, and once issued, the petition is then published in the Gazette. Um, incidentally, the Gazette website is very, very useful. I, I encourage you to spend a little time investigating it. Um, the effects of that publication in the Gazette are typically disastrous from the point of view of the debtor company, because the big financial institutions have armies of people combing the Gazette five days a week. Uh, to see if any of their corporate clients are subject to a petition. The reason being that the effect of publication is to put them on notice that the 
firm in question may not be able to pay its debts, in which case it may be wrongfully trading, and it may be transferring funds which ought to be used for the benefit of creditors. Naturally enough, the banks don't want to be on the hook for such transfers, so the simplest option for them is to freeze the firm's bank accounts, uh, and for most practical purposes, that amounts to stopping it trading. Uh, there is, incidentally, a way around this, an application can be made to the court by which um, if granted, it in effect provides an indemnity to the bank, which allows it then to unfreeze the firm's accounts pending a final determination of the petition. And whilst we're on the subject of workarounds, it's worth knowing that if a debtor company gets wind of a petition about to be advertised in the Gazette, which often happens because the creditor informs it as a kind of final warning, it can apply to the court on an urgent basis to restrain that publication. Um, but it will have to be prepared to demonstrate that the alleged debt is misconceived for some reason. Once the wheels of a petition have started turning in this way, that is by publication in the Gazette, they cannot be stopped until the court one way or another deals with the petition. So there's no room for a consent order, for instance, disposing with a published winding up petition merely because the debtor firm has paid its creditor whatever sum was specified by the creditor in the petition. This is because the court is, by that stage, concerned with all of the firm's creditors. Remember, it's, it's a class remedy. And the petition is no longer, if it ever was, um, an airing of a private grievance between only two parties. That is not to say that the court will be keen necessarily to grant the petition, but it will want to know more about the firm's financial standing if the judge is merely to, to dismiss that petition, as does happen, um, on the invitation of the parties. Indeed, what can happen is that other debtors come forward. Often they would have been alerted by publication in the Gazette and will naturally be alarmed not only by the apparent revelation that their debtor firm is in financial difficulty, but also by the prospect that what they are owed by the firm may, if action is not taken by them, result in the money that they are owed not being recognized by a liquidator. The action recommended in these circumstances is to issue a so-called notice of intention to appear as a creditor. This is a formal notice that this further creditor exists and either opposes or supports the petition. As you might expect, there can be a snowball effect as creditors come forward. All of a sudden, what may, from the debtor firm's point of view, have been a fairly manageable petition debt can suddenly become a cohort of similar claims for much larger and unmanageable amounts. One case from my own experience was for a nominal petition debt of about 14,000 pounds. By the petition came, by the time the petition came to be heard, Another dozen or so creditors had come forward, and their demands totaled about one and a half million pounds. So from a debtor company's perspective, it is of crucial importance not to let things get out of hand by the publication of a petition. Equally, from a creditor's perspective, this can be a powerful tool to encourage prompt payment, unless the debtor firm really is in financial trouble and simply cannot pay. In theory, a winding up petition ought to be brought only when the firm is believed to be insolvent. Knowing whether it is insolvent can be very difficult for a creditor to establish. So the decision as to whether to issue a winding up petition can be a finely balanced one. For instance, although the company's house website is an increasingly valuable resource for, among other things, apparently reliable and up-to-date financial information, and will often record the existence of charges against the firm's assets, it can remain difficult for unsecured creditors to know whether there are secured creditors uh, in the queue ahead of them. So bringing a petition and seeing it granted may result in nothing more than the secured creditors being paid while the unsecured creditors get nothing. Another feature to bear in mind is that insolvency practic practitioners act acting as liquidators can be very expensive. Um, hourly rates of 500 pounds plus VAT are commonplace up and down the country. And this will bite into the debtor firm's ability in liquidation to pay its circling creditors. There is also the risk of the court concluding that the petition was brought with some improper collateral motive in mind, for example, to cause the debtor firm financial difficulties, as uh, Daniel mentioned in relation to um, personal bankruptcy. Not only is, is that likely to sound in cost, it, it's also a tortious abuse of the court's process, um, which can sound in damages as well. So caution is advisable. Um, for anyone familiar, uh, I suppose most of us are, with, with um, the Church of England wedding service and the prayers at the calling of the bands, um, these words will certainly be familiar. Where the vicar says, marriage must not be undertaken carelessly, lightly or selfishly, but reverently, responsibly and after serious thought. And I endorse those words so far as winding up petitions are concerned. 
But if a creditor legitimately concludes that the debtor firm cannot pay and that its liquidation is the most effective way of enforcing the debt, how do you go about it? As I mentioned before, you can issue a statutory demand and doing so can be helpful if there is no serious pressure of time. If there is serious pressure of time, for example, because it is suspected that the debtor company's asset base is rapidly devaluing, then a letter of claim may be the better option because it allows the creditor to set a time limit for a response, whereas with the statutory demand regime, the debtor gets 18 days to respond and could send you on a wild goose chase with a forlorn application to set it aside, which takes months to be heard. Similarly, with a letter of claim, if the response is patently forlorn, you can take your chances in a prompt hearing with the insolvency judge, rather than hoping a DJ doing box work will notice how forlorn is the application to set aside. So if time is pressing, there may be real advantages, tactical advantages to a letter of claim. Assuming there is no answer to it or none that withstands uh, scrutiny, then simply Google, um, quote unquote, rule 7.5 winding up petition. And that, that will take you to a link which provides you with one of the two documents you have to fill out. They're fiddly, but fairly intuitive. You'll find the other document you need to complete on the same web, on the same web page. Three copies of these uh, documents are filed at court along with checks for court fee and petition deposit, uh, unless you have an HMCTS account. Um, the relevant court depends on the debtor firm's paid up share capital, which you can find on the company's house website. If it's less than 120,000 pounds, then the petition goes to the local court. Um, but given the way work is distributed among county courts, you may find it is then sent to another nearby. Again, a point touched on by Daniel previously in relation to personal bankruptcy. But that's the basic rule. Less than £120,000 in paid up share capital goes to the local court. Otherwise, it goes to the High Court. Bear in mind, the High Court in London, at least, uses CE file, uh, the online filing system. So you'll have to create a CE file account to do that if you don't already have one. In theory, there shouldn't be any dithering. The, the, the date um, will then be um, uh, uh, inserted on the um, petition and it's likely to be in the near future, a couple of weeks away. Uh, the sealed version of that um, petition is then served on the debtor firm and a certificate of service should be completed. The fateful advertisement in the Gazette must be at least seven working days before the petition is to be heard. So you have kind of limbo period. Finally, and I'm, I'm so I've got a lot to get through, taking this as a canter, but very finally, just a quick look to the future. Um, at the end of March this year, a few days after the lockdown began, the government announced that it would legislate to amend various provisions of the Insolvency Act in order to help businesses struggling due to the lockdown to continue trading. But nothing happened, and I certainly was starting to think it was one of those headline-grabbing announcements which had been quietly forgotten about. But then eight days ago, the Corporate Governance and Insolvency Bill got its first reading in Parliament. It's 238 pages long. It remains to be seen if it's an example of hard cases making bad law due to it being rushed. But the key provisions are radical, and they include temporarily removing the threat of personal liability from directors for wrongful trading, prohibiting termination clauses, which would otherwise engage in the events of insolvency, preventing suppliers from ceasing their supplies when a firm is going through a rescue process, uh, and prohibiting the presentation of winding up petitions for COVID-19 related debts. These provisions, I suspect, must be ripe for abuse and negative second order consequences. Um, on the other hand, just to conclude, if things continue as they are, uh, we do look set for a tsunami of corporate insolvencies. Thank you all. Thanks, Stephen. Um, as we said at the beginning, uh, we'll be taking uh, a couple of questions. Uh, I know we said we'd keep to the half, hour, half an hour mark uh, we've been half an hour, so um, let's just take one or two questions. So the first question we have is, once an order has been made, what items or possessions form part of the estate? Um, I take that to mean once a bankruptcy order has been made. Uh, so when we consider what property forms part of the estate, a good starting point is the insolvency service technical manual. Um, there can be some fiddly questions on the issues of what constitutes property, and, and that's obviously a good starting point. Uh, however, the Insolvency Act does provide a, a broad definition of, of, of property and provides that every description of property should be included, uh, and that also includes things in action, so any litigation, any uh, benefit of finance agreements, uh, things like that. Um, 
th there is a narrow exception that um, items needed for work or uh, everyday household items can be retained by the debtor. However, uh, if the value of the asset, uh, the asset in question, uh, exceeds the costs of a reasonable replacement, then that asset can be claimed by the trustee and replaced with a cheaper alternative. Okay, I, th I think there's another one on bankruptcy. So if you don't mind, I'll take this one, Stephen. Um, how, how can we get a bankruptcy order if the debtor is involved in an IVA? Uh, well, creditors are not prevented from uh, petitioning for bankruptcy if the, if the underlying debt is not part of the IVA. So um, if the underlying debt is part of the IVA, then of course you, you, you can't petition for bankruptcy. But if it's not part of the IVA, then you can. Nothing for me, I see. No, I, I think given the time, we said we'd keep to the half an hour mark. Uh, I propose to uh, close there. Uh, as we say, the contact details of our clerk is appearing on the, on the slide now. So if you do want any uh, bespoke answers to question, feel free to contact our clerk. Uh, and again, the webinar uh, together with the slides will be uploaded to the Goldsmith Chambers website um, after this presentation has ended. So thank you all very much for attending. Yes, thank you.